Well, good afternoon. Welcome to this edition of Finweek Money Matters, the show that helps you manage your finances. I'm Samantha Loring, and as per usual, my co-host Mark Ashton, editor of Finweek. While coming up on the show today, we're exploring ways in which to make your workforce achieve a business's ultimate goal, boosting, boosting the bottom line. How you may ask, well, many have said that happiness may be the key to that. In our new insight, anti-money laundering comes into focus as we uncover the key issues facing senior management and what does beating the benchmark really entail. And of course, we'll take a look at the latest when it comes to that and the role of portfolio management and asset management. All that coming up in the next hour. If you have any comments for us, please do remember to contact us. And of course, remember that uh, you can see uh, this week's Fin Week available on your shelves today. The magazine also available digitally in English and Afrikaans. That's via my subs. .co.za. As I said, if you have any comments for us, money matters at abn360.com is the email address to send them through to. Well, Finweek's cover story this week was made with happiness in mind. Google has made the world rethink employee relations, and it would appear that employee happiness is becoming ever more important for the world's leading organizations. Finweek uncovers that the secret to a killer workforce is, in fact, happiness. So we've got Jessica Habit from Finweek, Richard Mulholland, entrepreneur and founder of 21 Tanks and Missing Link, and then uh, Sandra Sacy, project manager at Missing Link, joining us for a more more creative look at uh, worker happiness. Thank you so much for joining us this week. So it's a happy Friday, Mark. Thanks, Thanks for introducing this topic and very important in this world where people are wanting flexible working hours and they're wanting to get, uh, I suppose, contentedness out of work. Sure. I mean, look, when, when the story first got pitched to me, I have to be honest, I was incredibly cynical. The idea of a happy workforce, okay, I get the, the gist of it is cool and it sounds nice, but you worry about, oh, this is a bit soft and fluffy and, you know, what does it actually mean for it? And I think that we all see Google has a fantastic office and, you know, you've got slides and swings and all the fine things there but you argue well cool they've got money they can you know it's, it's just a little bit of a marketing spiel for it but what the story did was actually unpacked why there's a value in a happy workforce and I think you got to kind of separate from a workforce where everybody's mates I mean Rich and I were just chatting just off air this idea of you know are your employees your mates you spend 80 percent of the time with them mm -hmm. how do you treat them as do you treat them co-workers as mates and then as a manager do you end up treating them as mates or do you or how do you manage that distinction mm -hmm. and I think that the idea was you can actually build a happy work force more productive they work longer they work harder they come up with better ideas if they are happy but it's a case of being able to dis differentiate and distinguish what is part what part of your workforce you're dealing with mm -hmm. Stacey you're sitting next to your boss today <laughs> <laughs> and of course uh, we'll talk about you know wh what you do at the company to create a happy workforce but uh, firstly tell us about what 21 tanks does so 21 Tanks is an innovation lab. We're out there trying to uh, make people think about things in a different way and, and get businesses unstuck from the, the growth patterns they're currently in. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you do that? I mean, how do you go into a business? And uh, I mean, wh what is the kind of first approach you have to unearthing uh, what is making people unhappy in a workforce? Okay, so the, we wouldn't traditionally be focusing just on what makes people happy or unhappy. That's not really our thing. That may be an objective. But our thing is to let people look at their businesses in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that, that's what they have to do. They have to be able to look at their business with outsider's eyes. With regards to the happiness aspect, this is, is relatively simple. You have to go in and remove unhappiness. There's not a golden formula for this. Job number one is what pisses you off and how do you take that out of your day to day? Mm -hmm. And if you can start off with that, then that's a good place, good place to be. Uh, so you remove all the pain for yeah. workers? Uh, I hate to oversimplify it, but yes, that's, mm -hmm. that's the key. And not all the pain, I want to still uh, grind it a little bit, but I'm it not It sounds ashamed. simple, uh, but it's not that simple. Um, you yeah, know, I mean, your thoughts, Jessica? Yeah, I was going to say, just maybe throwing a quick one yeah. to Rich, but yeah, I mean, how do you actually manage it though? So somebody comes in, they see a happy workforce, they see, I mean, we can use example of slides in the workplace, etc. But you know th that's a front-facing thing. It's not the it's not the cog in the kind of the, the behind the scenes that, that actually is driving the workforce. How do you distinguish between what people are seeing on the outside, which could look like a free for all, versus what's actually happening inside the business? 
Well, okay, so the first thing is the novelty wears off very quickly. You can have a triage and a slide, but that's going to make you excited for a week, and then thereafter it's just work, sure. right? Uh, if you want to be happy, you have to be happy in what you're doing. You have to realize what you're doing has purpose. Mm -hmm. So when you have somebody come back and tell you about uh, the work you did for them and how amazing it was, and when our guys realize how important what they do actually is, that's a great start to being happy. When you go home and you think like, wow, I actually did something today. I made a difference. Uh, I think that's a key, that's a key ingredient. And so... Everybody's got a purpose, but not everyone is reminded of it very often, and I think that is an important part. I think what came out of the article, and this was based on Richard's comments as well, is that people place too much emphasis on, I've got to find out what my true calling in life is, I've got to find my purpose. But if we can just start out with making the actual working environment a pleasant place to be and make people look forward to being at work, then they have a better chance of actually finding that purpose and sort of getting comfortable in that role. So mm -hmm. I think starting with the environment, um, which you you have created at 21 Tanks and Missing Links. I've visited your offices. It's a great place to be, and I didn't want to leave personally. It was just funky, and I think that's what CEOs and managers need to focus on. Make the environment a good place to be. Okay, I've got a question there for Sandra. So now you're, you're, you're a would-be employee. You, you come into the business. It looks like it's cool, and you think, cool, okay, this is a place that I want to work for. What is it that made that a compelling place to go and work? As, a, as When you were being interviewed, what is it that kind of, because I think it's one of the issues that managers face, is they sit there and they look at how do I attract the best talent? So you, you suddenly find somebody who's enthusiastic, but you know, what is it that kind of sold it for you? Well, what really sold it for me was the fact that when I went to Missing Link, this is my first job, and um, I didn't have really any experience. And Rich, um, I'd been there for an internship for about a month, and when they sat down and said, right, we'd like to offer you a job, you don't quite have the, the expertise or the experience, but what you do have is the attitude, and mm -hmm. that's what we love. Mm -hmm. And that's what I loved, is the fact that even though I didn't maybe have the experience, they wanted to take the chance on me because I had a really rad attitude. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. It's about appreciating the little things and an, an attitude, a simple positive attitude, and my enthusiasm. And that's why I got hired, and that's, and that's what I thought, wow. This is awesome. So, I mean, that also goes to the issue of what you do with the bad apples, as they sometimes termed in an organization, what you do with the cynics. Um, do you work on their attitude? Do you weed them out? I mean, what's your approach and what would your advice be there? Well, job number one is uh, you deserve the people you've got, right? Mm -hmm. So you hire them, you deal with them. So the first of all is there's no complaining about it. You have to deal with it, mm -hmm. but you owe it to everybody to deal with it. A bad apple doesn't just bother you, the business owner or the manager. They bother every person that they work around. And they, they remove that purpose from everyone by, by belittling the purpose, the job, the things they do. So job number one, deal with it. I don't care how you do it, but deal with it. Job number two is if you build environment where you choose the right people in the first place you have a lot less bad apples and more importantly they tend to work themselves out because when you've got such a community the one person in that community who doesn't fit will realize that straight away and they will either leave on their own accord or they'll almost be forced out by the environment mm -hmm. when you when you take a lot of thought into choosing your people wisely and that's where it happens you make your money on a house when you buy the house not when you sell the house you make the decision on the people when you hire them Mm -hmm. not when you get them through the training process. What do you do for people through personality tests? I mean, what's your approach to making sure that you're hiring someone who's positive, optimistic, someone who's going to see the, the world as glass half full? Well, you ask them questions, and what we do is we don't hire them. We say yeah. to them, come in and spend some time with us. Come in and sit around. Let's see if you like us. Let's see if we like you. Mm -hmm. We're certainly not for everyone. I swear like a trooper. Uh, you must see my internal engine try to hold me back right now. But, uh, and then you sit and you work with people, and you, uh, after a month, you may look at them and think, wow, they're not the best at what they do, but man, I could dig working with that person every day. Yeah. What a great foundation, because you can build on the talent especially if you've got great enthusiastic people who want to teach. Mm -hmm. So, so that, is, that is the job. Don't make your decision on an interview. And, and don't hire people because they've got a great CV. Hire people based on the same criteria you'd invite them over to dinner for a dinner party. You never look at somebody's qualifications and say, okay, well, you're in. You know, you hire them because you want to, because they're interesting and you want to spend time with them. And that's what you have to do with people at work as well. Mm. How do you fake happiness though? So Rich <laughs> said you could fake um, being enthusiastic about you or, or fake happiness in, in the article. How do you fake happiness at work? Because there are plenty of times where people come to work and they don't feel like actually faking it. Be, you know, they don't feel it. How do you fake it and still be able to keep the, the enthusiasm going the whole time? You know, I think people forget at the end of the day that happiness is a choice. Sure. It's a choice that you make to wake up every morning, have a positive attitude and have a positive approach. And that's just the type of person I am. You know, we talk about 
this happy environment, but a happy environment at work can also go so far that it's 50-50 it's as far as I'm concerned. You also need to come into work every day with a positive attitude um, and a positive outlook. And, and it is hard and we're in a very stressful environment. Mm -hmm. It is. It's high pressure. It's deadline driven. And I, But I think you've got to make the choice to be positive. You've got to make the choice to be happy. Mm -hmm. And that's a personal choice that you make. And when you have an environment that's conducive to a happy working space and you're also happy on top of that I mean it's 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 a place that where magic can happen okay but then I got a question Do, are you looking beyond this job is is looking beyond this job the thing that makes you enthusiastic about going to work? <laughs> <laughs> because oh, I, I've, I've been you can also ask Jessica that question and put her on the spot <laughs> but, but I do believe I mean I think the problem with a lot of the workforce at the moment yeah. is that they get so used to a job is a job is a job and then they're, they're, they're never looking to, to move beyond and I think that the thing that actually motivates a lot of people is the fact that they're, they're aiming for something beyond where they are at the moment yeah, for sure. But uh, right now what I'm just trying to do in, uh, at Missing Link is I'm trying to push myself and, and push my boundaries at Missing Link in the space that I'm in. I think mm -hmm. it's really important to live every day in the present. And so I'm not really looking too much ahead right now. I'm just saying, how can I be the best that I can be in mm -hmm. this job right now with what I'm learning? And my goodness, do I learn something new every day. I mean, I so mean, just looking at the numbers, let's just take it back to some of the research. Uh, you know, Google, of course, is the prime mm -hmm. example we brought up. Hey Group shows that happy people are 43% more productive. Gallup survey shows that happy companies are 33% more profitable. Um, so we're bringing it back to this question around personal growth mm -hmm. and, and bettering yourself and seeing uh, beyond just what you're doing at that point in time. So how do you incorporate that, uh, that focus in terms of ambition, personal growth uh, for employees within the company? Is that something that's core to creating a happy workforce? Okay, so remember doing well at your job and doing well at what you do is part of your career path. So if, if I enjoy what I'm doing and I'm productive at it, I feel great about myself. The, the end result for the company is the company reaps all the benefits of that. Okay, so you're, you're playing with people's ambition here. Mm -hmm. If you've hired the right person, they will measure how happy they are based on how far they can, they can grow and achieve within a business or within a construct. Mm -hmm. And so if you can create the formula for that to happen, as the employer, you reap all the benefits of that. Well, they get the benefit too, but you get all the, the, the flip side. So you've got people who are working harder, trying to drive themselves, trying to push further, push harder, do better. Uh, your clients are the ones who sit there and see the end result of that, and you as a shareholder is the one who gets to take that home. It so is a, a great link. So practically, does it, be, does it become a dialogue and an ongoing dialogue between um, what are your ambitions? Do you feel that the work you're doing every day is helping you grow and helping you achieve what you'd like to in your career? I mean, do you need to have a formal process in place for every employer to understand that, uh, those ambitions? Yes, and we do. So our performance criteria is not based on uh, animate faster or make a video better. It's based on, on what you want to achieve as a person. So for example, last year we paid our bonuses to guys who did a personal best squat or X amount of burpees <laughs> or uh, read three novels and things like that. Like We don't mind. You define your objective. We'll work out how we get you there. And, and the, again, you can't, you can't have a great life and a, and a crappy work life. You've mm -hmm. got to have some sort of balance there. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're always looking at the person holistically and trying to, to, to build them as a person, a complete person, rather than just the little chunk that you're hoping to leech from, mm -hmm. well then you're going to be better off in the end result. If you build the whole person, you get the whole profit. I think what's coming out very strongly from this and from Rich's comments is there needs to be an appreci appreciation of the individual. Mm -hmm. So what are the individual's goals? What are their personal preferences for how they like to work, mm -hmm. who they like to work with, where they like to work from? So companies can no longer take this approach of everyone needs to be treated the same. It's that old thing of just being a number. Companies that take that approach, we're starting to see that people leave. They don't attract the best talent. So mm -hmm. it's an appreci appreciation of the individual and, and finding ways to work with them. So I've got, I've got a question, I'll call it manager's prerogative, and I'll put it in the employee and then the employer first. <laughs> okay, so Jack Walsh <laughs> says to you, 10% of your staff, you should turn over 10% of your staff each year. The bottom 10%, you should roll them over. So if you were working as an employee in a business where the manager said to you, 10% of you won't be here in 12 months' time, do you think it would create a positive or a negative working environment? Depending on if you want to stay there or not, I suppose. So would, it in, so would it incentivize you to be more productive or do you think it would feel like an axe constantly hanging over your head? 
I think it could work as both. It depends mm. on the type of person you are. You could look at it as I say, you know what, I want to stay here next year. I'm going to work my butt off to make sure I am here. Or, oh, you know what, if they want me to go, then I'm going to go. It really comes down again to an attitude. I think that that's you negative have. motivation. Well, yeah. it's my question. So, I mean, if, if you were going to. Okay, so. Uh, and, uh, in a smaller business is fundamentally different. Jack Welch can say that because they're not people, right? Sure. They are employee numbers. And it's very easy to work through that as, a, as a, it is a human resource yep. in the true sense of the word. Yep. In a small business, it's not the same. However, I do believe 10% of the people should leave every year. But I believe they should leave of their own accord. If you've been in a business for a certain period of time, it's time for everybody. You know, you go to one school for a certain period of time, you go to one club, we have one hobby, and work is the same. Mm. Uh, this idea of lifers is probably gone. Yeah. The idea of people staying. So I, I encourage guys there are guys have a thing that's called uh, it's basically a play on 10% time but slightly different if somebody can come up with a business plan for a business they want to write and they sit there and they put it in place they can take Fridays off for six months until they've started their business mm. and as guys have done it and been competitors to us but we we still allow it that's still the purpose because if they're ready to go and want to leave the worst thing you can do is try and uh, and hold them hold them back mm -hmm. you speak a lot to corporates though. I mean do you think corporates are buying into this idea that they can have a dynamic workforce because I think it, it's very it, to your point is a general electric and kind of look at everybody as a human resource and, and not individuals are so that free and businesses actually getting to the point where they can treat businesses or employees as a dynamic resource no okay. South African business the, the problem with I don't think this is South African business I think this is big business in general is the business of businesses is, is getting far in business mm. so what you have is you have a, a workforce a group of people who are actually measuring how they do based on how far they get not on, on often how much greatness they've done. And I think there are huge exceptions. A number of my clients are, are completely the opposite. But the problem is if you're just trying to get a, climb a ladder, climb a rung, then it's not actually about the work you do. It's about the how I get to the next rung. And so they, they almost motivate the wrong behavior. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's, the, that's the problem. We have to be okay with people coming in and going out and coming back again. Yeah. But as a CEO, how would you begin to change the culture? Does it need to come from you? Does it need to come from management? Where do you start? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, the job of creating a culture in an organization can only flow down. I've seen companies try to do these culture workshops from the ground up and they don't work. It has mm -hmm. to start. You have to give permission, right? So and that's all you have to do. And then you have to lead by example. And, and yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you say don't hold too tightly. Um, and, and just one last thing I want to ask you, sweating the assets is, is a, quite a common yeah. term that is used at the moment, people trying to cut costs and trying to do uh, more with less. Should that term be banned in, in the workplace? Should it be banned in, at boardroom level? No, certainly not. We're still trying to run a business. I, st I still want to retire and, and live a great life. Yeah, but uh, no, I think, but you've got to sweat the, the correct assets. So I think the things that some people see as soft issues are not as soft as they think they are. And I think if you try to look at the number of things we've done, even just creating, say, Missing Link's office, I think we spent a million bucks on it. That's the cheapest marketing I have ever spent in my life. Mm -hmm. And people would say, oh, but you're wasting money on the soft stuff. This is cold, hard cash coming back to us in terms of the publicity we get. Mm -hmm. but, and yet they'll spend money on other things or it's just a check in a box that mm -hmm. they see as business imperatives, which, which I don't see the same way. So I think we have to reassess how we, how we make this up yeah. and, and, and apply new rules and then sweat the assets. But they're not the same assets we've always sweated before. Well, there we go. We'll have to leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate your time. Uh, that Richard Holland, entrepreneur and founder of 21 Tags and Missing Link. And Sandra Stacey, project manager at Missing Link. Jessica stays with us for our next segment, uh, but it's a time now to take a look at our Fin Week Trade of the Week. So taking a look at a property stock, Vividant uh, Income Fund, tell us about that. Okay, so call it morbid financial journalism humor, but I quite mm -hmm. like the idea of a business where SARS actually pays you to pays you money through your investment. So basically the idea of Vividant owns a whole lot of properties in mm -hmm. sort of the 50 to 100 million rand um, size category, which makes them smaller than your likes, your growth points who own all of the big shopping centers. And in amongst those assets, they include the SARS building in Vit Bank and, and a lot of very niche assets around South Africa. Um, they've recently just done a rights issue at a five rand 40 a share, and the share's now done at five rand 10. But it's an interesting business, got a 10% dividend yield before you start, uh, nine, nine times earnings multiple, they've just got, they've got all this extra cash from the rights issue. It looks compelling, you know, if directors are prepared to put in money at five rand 40 and you can get it at five rand 10, um, you know, the math seems to add up. Property exposure in South Africa right now and also in light of the fact that uh, property hasn't really managed to recover. 
Yeah, I mean, look, it depends how you define recover. I mean, if you're earning a, c a consistent 7% dividend or 7% after tax return, it's not a bad return yeah, to start. Yeah, so you're looking at the property sector and then, of course, the property stock completely Sure, and, and I think that the, pro the issue that you have at the moment is that property has been dominated by growth point and redefine. They own 90% of the is listed property assets. Mm -hmm. And we started seeing a lot of new things coming into the market. Vivid interesting because they've got niche little portfolios and the things that the big players would tend to steer clear of. And I think that's quite exciting. I mean, you can find nice assets, good yield, good tenants, and you, you don't have such a big base that you're trying to keep your, you know, such a high cost base. You've got mm -hmm. nice properties and you can work out your best yield on them. Well, there we go. An idea for this week's trade of the week, uh, Vivident uh, Income Fund. Uh, do you remember that? Uh, you can read more about these stories and many others in this week's edition of FinWeek. That's on the shelves from today. The magazine also available digitally in English and Afrikaans via mysubs.co.za. It's time now to pay the bills here at CNBC Africa. We'll be back with some insight right after this short break. Welcome back to Finweek Money Matters. Now, in this new segment of the show called Insight, we give some understanding salient business issues. And this week, anti-money laundering is in focus. Uh, this has developed significantly over the past 20 years, and recent regulatory scrutiny has seen unprecedented fines being handed down. As a result, uh, AML, as it's referred to, has become a key issue for senior management and banking institutions, both locally and internationally. For more on this, uh, we look at KPMG's Africa Anti-Money Laundering Service. Survey 2012, and we're joined by Kevin West, KPMG Partner for Anti-Money Laundering, and Manette Bassan, KPMG Associate Director for Anti-Money Laundering. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. So I suppose this is a quite a relevant topic, given what HSBC is doing when it comes to downsizing their operations in North Africa. Um, tell us about what HSBC's decision uh, means right now in light of uh, the developments when it comes to a crackdown on anti-money laundering. I think... Um if we look at HSBC's decision, it's a clear indication of the impact um, that non-compliance with specific regulations in anti-money laundering and sanctions related fields can have on a business. Um, it, that impact is, is as vast as, as the closure of businesses, the downsizing uh, of businesses, which in its turn um, <clears throat> can have a massive impact uh, on, on reputational issues as well. Could they have avoided it? I mean, is, is that what banks are trying to do, Manette? I think they're more, in fact, trying to be preventive now. Um, with regards to this HSBC one, specifically, it was someone found guilty of money laundering within the bank. And they decided, you know what, we had a look at our risk. We decided that we, we cannot now take the chance anymore. We are now ready to, to say, we look at revenue. But even though the cost of non-compliance is so big, the cost of having this reputational, as Kevin mentioned, on, with mm -hmm. regards to having someone being found guilty of money laundering, yeah. it's just too big. I'm being cynical here again, but you know, is the actual are the banks actually cracking down on it? I mean, we seem to be seeing scandal after scandal after scandal, and uh, and you know, yes, there's been a lot of anti-terrorism legislation, money laundering, and, and there's different issues that are coming through. And it almost it gives the it, to the outsider it gives the impression that they're just sticking up their hand and saying, okay, oops, we were guilty, yeah. we won't do it mm. again. Um, and <coughs> you you you're probably right in in the perception that that is uh, that is out there, um, but we know you know specifically from the work that we're doing, the, the amount of money and investment sure. that the financial institutions are making um, <coughs> into anti-money laundering on the one side, and secondly, it, it's the increase in, in the supervision and regulation mm. on the other side. So, you know, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing is, is an evolving issue. Um, it, it's, it's a moving target. Um, and each year, it's becoming more and more onerous, um, and, and the banks have to play catch up. Is, um, it, is, is the issue that the institutions are too big to be able to genuinely supervise? Because I, I, I get the sense that almost regulators are, are, are too scared to actually crack down too hard because they might actually be scared of what they find. And maybe, again, this is an outsider's perspective, not having insight into it. But the, the, the perception seems to be that every time you lift up the rock, they might find something they don't want to find. So they, they, they it, it's a reactive situation. It doesn't seem to be a preemptive situation. And do you think that's a fair comment, or do you think that it has genuinely changed over the last couple um, of years? I think it has changed. I think we see 
and, and our survey certainly also does show that is, is the increase of the involvement of senior management okay. um, in respect <coughs> of, of setting the tone in respect of anti-money laundering. It is driven, you know, specifically our experience in South Africa, mm -hmm. it, is, it is driven very hard by, by senior management. They take it seriously and I think our, our supervisory um, institutions are starting to take the matter seriously as well. Yeah, Sp specifically with regards to um, the updated guidance note 3A that was issued by the FIC. For the first time, it says in a clear paragraph that your KYC, your anti-money laundering terrorist financing control policies will be approved by board level. Mm. And it's not just, and as Kevin said, the tone of the top is very important, but don't forget how important it is to bring the, the mindset of compliance, not only to at board level, because they could be very passionate about fighting money laundering, mm. but if the guy at the branch sitting right when the customer walks in doesn't take that seriously, you're fighting a losing battle. Sure. So how then do you build that into um, you know, compliance at the bottom? I mean, what type of, uh, what type of measures are businesses building into their, um, into their procedures, basically? Yeah, training. I cannot emphasize, and this survey yeah. also showed, how important training at your front line, because you've got a high turnover in branches, mm. financial institution mm. branches, where people just, they start and within three months they leave. Your adequate training, refresher training, telling people how, what to be aware of, how to a suspicious transaction, how to identify one, what do you constitute as suspicious, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think in, in support of that is, is the, the investment in technology. Um, the technology side of, of, of anti-money laundering is, is developing at, at a rapid space, uh, pace, um, and, and the cost of that investment is also not very cheap. It, mm -hmm. is, it 